Kim Ringland. And Kim is a friend to almost everyone in this room, and almost everyone at the San Ignacio Market knows Kim because of her expertise in herbs. She's not just an herbalist, she is a master herbalist. She's very grounded and she's very um, in tune on different levels with all the herbs she brought today and more herbs. This and is my done, And she, this is her passion. <laughs> And she does also like um, cleaning and she sells things at the market on Fridays. If you have any kind of ailment, you talk to Kim and she will make oh, advice for you. Try. Yeah, yeah, she'll make good advice for you. So um, Kim's been teaching in a class in herbs for the last six months and several of us in this room have the opportunity to go to teach it with Susie Mickler. Susie's doing the healing, Kim's doing the herbs. So if you're interested in that, talk to Kim actually because it's a very full rounded course in herbs. So, um, Kim, do you want to say a few more words about yourself, where you live? and I Yeah, I moved to Belize about 12 years ago, bought a place, and have been trying to get here ever since. So I've been here now two years pretty much straight. And uh, the reason for that was that in 10 years, I'm a master herbalist and I call myself a botanical master herbalist. I believe in finding my plants. There are differences. You can buy the herbs and you can Treat people, no problem. You can know what you're doing. That's not a problem. But when you're out picking the plants, you need to know 100% before you pick it and give it to somebody exactly what you're giving them. So I consider myself, that's my expertise. I like to know the plant I'm picking. So um, I started in uh, Western herbs and Native American herbs. And then I moved from there to my certification in 2004, which included India herbs as well as Chinese herbs, and then came here because I have a great-grandmother that was supposedly Yucatec Maya, and decided it was time to learn a new modality of herbs. The hardest herb study I've ever done in my life, and I'm nowhere near finished. Um, we have more of similar kinds of leaves than anywhere in the world. Um, but. Staying two full years has finally got me to a point where I now ride my horse and drive down the road going, yes, that's that, that's that, that's that, that's that, that's that, from trees to vines. And until you can do that, you can't really prescribe them for other people. You can't make sure they get the right thing. If you've got thick blood, I don't want you taking red yam, I want you taking white yam. And they look the same in the woods practically. And you got to be really good at it. Plus, the woods in this country, unless you know what you're doing in the bush, can be an interesting place and can also be dangerous. You don't want to startle any of the creatures that live here that take care of their own defense because they all are capable of making sure that you hurt. <laughs> From wasps on up. <laughs> And of course, the ant population. <laughs> so what I did is I brought you a smattering of what I grow in my yard. And this is after bushing my whole place. Uh, what I leave is a, a mixture of medicine, a mixture of beautiful, and I am a forester. So trees are of ultimate importance to my place. And depending on the size of your lot, what I'm going to try to show you today is how to landscape your house with medicine plants. So that when you walk out the door, you can have the most necessary plants and basic. I'm not talking heavy medicine, I'm talking basic medicine. So colds, flus, fevers, headaches, you know, things like that. I've got an infection. Let's look at those plants first. And that's what we put around the house, is, is these kinds of plants. Um, I have here, though, I'm going to just sort of pass out a couple of things. I have a couple of yard ideas that um, I've drawn up here and there. That'll show you a house, basically. Let's say this is the back stoop, the front door, the front gate. Let's say you're looking at north being down right now, so we'll turn it around. We'll go this way. North's up, south's down. We got east on this side of the building, west on the other side. 
When you're landscaping anybody's place, depending on your environment, you're looking for the most you can get out of your plants, including shade. Your west side should always have a tree somewhere out there that can give you a little bit of relief in the afternoon in this country. You know, so you want to you wanna put in your bones, you're going to want to make sure you put in your trees. I brought a variety of the trees that I use. I use allspice, avocado, hammond, balsam. Balsam is one of the most beautiful trees in the world and can be kept small. Um, it's uh, where we get all cough medicine from. Dexamethorphan comes from the bark of balsam trees. <laughs> Uh, you know, these are the things that you can put in a corner of your yard or on a west side or an east side of your house and have yourself a really nice little tree that's not so big, depending on your lot size. Trees are always going to be determined by how much lot size you have. Uh, for a small lot, you're not going to want a whole lot of trees, you're just going to want a few. But you can still put a Hammond tree somewhere on the west and have all that shade in the west side instead of all that heat. Or on the south, if you've got an open exposed place, a little bit of height on the south side is good. You're going to get a little less heat. And it doesn't have to be right over your house. You know, we get a lot of this drift in this country. The sun will be to the south, it'll be to the north, you know. So you're going to get a lot of drift on your stuff. But what we've tried to do is I've tried to give us a couple of little yard ideas. I'm going to just put these out and as we start to look at things, people can just take a look at the plants. We have small plants. You're going to find that we have... Um, your best candidates for around the house are going to be your oreganos like this. This creeps along the ground. This is a plant that's good in beans. It's good for cooking. It's good for thyroid problems and metabolism. It increases metabolism in everybody. It's good for diabetes consequently. And we have epidemics of diabetes everywhere. So on this table there are probably, I don't know, at least 16 plants that can be used for diabetes. And um, Belize has the medicine to cure it. People won't try it, though, because we've all talked everybody into believing that the only way to get health care is to wait for the army and get a good doctor. And uh, my grandmother raised, I don't know, nine children at home, and none of them remembers going to a doctor once in their life. So as far as I'm concerned, doctors are for broken bones, brain tumors. Um, <laughs> There's a good reason to have a good doctor, you know, but they're not for every day I got a cold. I have a sore throat. I have pink eye. I have, you know, most of that can be cured with so many other plants. And even the pink eye thing going around right now, there's a whole lot of plants that they say are supposed to be really good for it in this country, but nobody's asking. So, you know, it's, most grandmothers know. But the generation between has been dumbed down. Now, we in America were like that in the 50s and 60s. Then we decided to rebel in the 70s and 80s, and all of those people decided to do other things. They didn't want to do medication all the time, and we're in that group now. So that's an awesome group because we've all decided a long time ago, medication is the last thing I want to do. Because once I start it, really hard to stop it. Even the aspirin a day, thin your blood, aspirin a day, boom, 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 boom. Now the, the reports coming out are, do not stop that aspirin a day. You'll throw a clot. And that's sad, because you could have done it with a whole plant medicine and done white willow, and it would never throw a clot on you. Because it's got the buffers, it's got the catalyst, it has the emulsifiers that get everything to work correctly together. We split out all these isolates and then we use them as a medicine and then we forget that now we've, now we've got the side effects of bad stomach and a bad this and a bad that. Whole plant medicine, you've got everything in the plant. So it's, you know, all the way down to this little fern is good for every kind of cleansing you could ever need inside all internal organs. What's the name of that one? This is maidenhair fern especially good for women, but then it has a man's fern cousin. So if I needed to go with men, I would go with this one. If I needed to go with women, I would go with this one. 
Is there any difference between the northern varieties that are acid loving and the ones here that are? Not that I've noticed. It loving. might give them a different stem color, is what I really mm -hmm. notice. Is sometimes it'll give them a different color. Uh, they're dealing with more alkaline. I've got a plant at home. I didn't bring it. Um, called Golandrina, and I'm always asked why one Golandrina has red stems and the other one doesn't when they're the same plant. And I said, well, they're cousins. And this one's in limestone and this one's in black dirt. Mm. That can be the change in color of stem. It's the pH, in the pH in the ground. Will that change the medicinal properties? Not really. I, mean, the, the I, I often say that if it's the most important one for you is the one that grows out your door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's needing you. Yes, ma'am. What's ma the application? The application for Golandrina is that it's a catalyst for everything. But what I'm saying is that, consequently, you can get different colors in different plants, and people will ask me, is that the same plant? I say, yeah, it's the same plant. This one's application is for kidney, uh, blood detox. A lot of people use it for hair detox. Um, it happens to be an herb that was used by women to give their husbands that drank too much because it makes you sick on alcohol. But do you, do you, um, do you lay it on you or do you drink you, it? You, you, you drink it as a tea. You drink it as a tea. Tea, okay. Women a lot of times would use it as a vaginal steam as well. Though. <coughs> so in this country you did vaginal steams after babies. You did vaginal steams after any bad experiences. You know, so that's how women worked here. There wasn't a, you didn't have the cleansing apparatus they have in the states, you know. Use the, the root as a... Yeah, when I do when I do certain things, I do all the whole plant. Like this one. Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay. This is strong back. Strong back's just what it does. It's good for backs. <laughs> and they tell you, you have to use the whole plant. <laughs> roots all the way up. The roots are not Yeah, all the way to the top. And what it has is those stickery Seeds that catch you all the time, you can't get them off, that's the top. They tell you that should be in it too. Mm. We took those off so I wouldn't have them all over me today. <laughs> Has a beautiful little purple flower though. So if you can put it in the back of a garden area, it's a very nice plant to have around for pain. Boil so one whole plant. you only want to use it when it's in seed, if it's not seeding, then you don't want to use it? You can always cut the tops off of it. It'll come no, back. No, no, if you want the whole plant, yeah. it's not past flowering and producing seed, you still would use it. Yes. Yes, I would. I would I would have the whole I would have the seeds in there too and everything. You know, but to carry it today was gonna be all over me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I have a question on the on the where that grows. Um, on my mountain of work to come in, it's everywhere on both sides. Oh sure. But I think that's the limestone one you were talking about. That won't grow in the yard then. Probably not as good, but they all pretty much will take off anywhere. And you notice this one's this very hard to pull out. Uh -huh. Takes a strong back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who knows how it got that common name, but that's exactly it. It take you have to be strong to pull it. And right now it's really wet, so it came up easy. I went, yay! <laughs> moringa. You know. Moringa's a food now. I mean, this is a miracle food, a superfood. And um, a moringa tree in the corner of your east side of your house can be cut at three feet all the time. It will always come back. You can't get rid of it. So you don't have to let it get to be a big tree. You control it like you do madre de cacao. You just keep cutting it off. <laughs> and you don't have to have a tree that's... 30 feet tall. Some of us are challenged, like when you start them growing, <laughs> it's not as wide as your finger, but sometimes you can have 10 cuttings and five of them will flourish and the other one will just like... The, the different flowers. moons when you cut that stuff, I found, you know, and different barks, if it's not, if it isn't the right bark, it doesn't root right, and I, yeah, so I did them from seed when you're a hundred Indian seeds that somebody brought me, and it's a completely different leaf structure. Mm -hmm. It's this one. Very small leaves. Yeah. Not every leaflet is tiny. And that's the one that comes out of India. And um, the one that comes from here usually has a larger leaf. And the only part of that plant that I don't think is totally medicinal is its flower. Mm -hmm. The flower is really good to eat and eggs and stuff like that, but it's not considered a real medicinal part of the plant. The rest of it, vitamins, horseradish out of the roots, you can, Full sun? 
Yeah, they'll take full sun, park shade. They're aggressive. They'll take anything you give them. <laughs> and when, when you say grow. the one from India and the one that's here, neither in, one is native here, though, right? They're no, both. the one in India is native to India, right, but, but not here. Why, but the one that you're talking about... The, this here is still a kind. cutting. Yeah. You're talking about two different kinds. <coughs> neither one is native to Belize. Not at all. Okay. Now, how do we get so many non-native plants? <laughs> Situation around the whole planet. <laughs> well, that's true, but we had more non-native plants in this area in 500 A.D. than any place else in the world because the Maya loved to trade plants and cuttings for cacao. So they would trade their little cacao seeds for the next whatever beautiful plant somebody brought from somebody else. That's why places like, uh, um, is it El Pilar? Up by uh, Bullet Tree, is that the one out of Bullet yeah. Tree? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's called the, the jungle or the guard, forest garden or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And it's all, those guys were really into just every cutting they could get. You yeah. know, different plants from everywhere in this country. And Belize like, plants like Belize. Mm -hmm. Just about anything will grow here. Look at all that Empamita vine everywhere. We have Hawaiian baby wood rose seeds everywhere. We have all these morning glory vines that you start to just to ID the morning glory vines. It's insane that we have so many varieties right here. You know, and that's just a walk up any of the country roads. And it's just, it's, in, it's amazing. This is a high blood pressure tree. It's the Hammond tree or the almond tree, the Indian almond. But the leaf is good for high blood pressure. Um, Anato, we use it in Ricardo and also in colorings, but the Ricardo is red, giving me the idea that it's probably a good blood tonic. That's why they make the Ricardo from it. You know, it's a good, it's a good, it's good for your body. If it's if anything red, is always good for your circulatory system, from beets to you can go on forever to this little guy. This is a baby China root. Best blood tonic in the world is a little china root, like, or is china root. Now that doesn't have the big tuber off the side yet. And then this is the white yam, which everywhere in the world is looking for this plant. I have a lot of that. <laughs> well, how do you use it, though? You boil it, and, and it's good for high blood pressure. It's good for all hormone imbalance. It's good for colds, flus, diabetes. So just a chunk like that? I it? take it and chip it into smaller chunks so I get more surface area. Uh -huh. And then the I just boil it 20 minutes. Huh? The inside. Of yeah, the and then I boil it for like 20 minutes. Uh -huh. The harvest on it is to always leave the top and put to put back in the ground and harvest the bottom off the big root. Whereas with the china root, you never take the vine. You always dig way down next to it and find one of those tubers that's coming off to the uh -huh. side to harvest. Um, sustainable harvest is probably my biggest um, gripe in the world. Did Throw you it in your yard and you can sustainably harvest it any day of the week. But this vine, Contrivo, is over harvested. It's, we're running out of it in the wild. And this is just a young one, but I grow a fence of this. I grow it with white yam and red yam on the same fence so that people can see all three vines growing together. <clears throat> But this has a very distinct smell. You want to roll that and smell that. And Contrivo is good for all energy. If you wanted a monster drink, Contrivo in your water is, is just that. It's a monster drink every time you take a sip of water. It's pure energy and good for the whole body. And you can use the um, sticks from that. Too. Yeah, I take a stick, I cut them, and I make sure I got little what I call water bottle sticks. And you just throw one of these little one inch, two inch pieces in your water bottle for the day. Keep filling it up with water and it's just like an energy drink, you know, and the guys out in the bush use it all the time, chicleros especially. Yeah, the, the, the old loggers in Belize, is that what they use? Yeah, that was the, that's the country of okay. And, you know, everybody says, oh, well, that one's not brown and it's not the dry one and it's not the, I said, does it smell? And they go, oh, yeah. I said, well, then it probably has some sort of ability to do what it's supposed to be doing. If is that a use raw, or do you make yeah. a tea? You can do it as a cold tea. So raw is good. And you could just chew on the vine if you wanted to. You know, and I like it when it's green like that, just to chew on. And I find that for women, I like to use it in the green as, rather than in the, the um, 
It's a rough, long, brown vine when it's older. And you feel like it gives you energy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I try not to give myself too much more energy, though. <laughs> that would be counterproductive. <laughs> when, you, when you call something a white yam, then does it have nutritional value like a yam or no? This Desclorella comes in many shapes and sizes, and the Japanese form is longer and skinnier, and they use it like an actual food in soups. So yes, this can be found in different forms that are actually almost like a food, more of a, uh, more of a tuber. But the big one we get here that's that great big thing that sits in the ground with the vines on top, no, it's just a big old woody guy that you got to chop up and boil. And it's mostly just to drink. But I've seen it in different forms. The Chinese one definitely is a vegetable. Is that related to cocoa? Niam? It looks like it. They call it that, though. See, that's the other one in Spanish here that's called white coco meca, which means white coco yam. Ah. And in, they call the red one uh, coco meca. You know? And so, yeah, you've got to... That was the other thing to learn here, is that there's a bunch of names that are all the same, and they aren't the same plant. And They call one redhead like this. Poly redhead can be used on the skin at all times. You can roll a leaf up and put it on a bug bite, and it just makes it feel better, right? But they also have one that's called, well, it's an alcepius. It's a milkweed, and it has a little red head on top mm -hmm. with orange flowers, and the butterflies love it, so we call it butterfly weed. But it's also here called redhead. And if you put that liquid on your skin, it will burn. Don't feed it to your belly. Yeah. You know, and its other name, the Osepius, is a loco weed. You don't want your horses eating it. You want your cows eating it. You don't want your goats or your sheep to eat it. It's a it's a loco weed. Can you use it for a skin peel? You can use it for Leishmaniasis mm -hmm. and bot fly. You put it right on those sores and let it burn as long as you can take it. No, just not just a facial peel. I've never tried it that way. No, I would rather use a citrus here, which I would use probably. Um, Turmeric, yogurt, and for the citrus, I would probably go with lemongrass tea and boil it down. You get a citronella from lemon to a grass that's higher in the citrus. If anything, grapefruit skins is a better citrus peel for the skin. What but, do you do with this purple one? Which one? When you finish, what do you do with the purple one variety? It's the same, same oh, genus, but it's... Uh, yeah, I... I uh, the big red one is used for all kinds of anemia, weak, tired blood, um, thin blood. But once you get your blood counts up, I have a guy that used to drink the red one all the time. He had to stop. No, he, I'm talking about the purple one. It's about. Oh, the, oh, I, I haven't seen that. I mean, I don't. Patricia has a bunch Yeah, I don't see it here. So. It's smoking. Yeah, and it's this is the only one I've ever looked for. Very extremely different leaf than that. Yeah. Though. Yeah. But it's in the same genus. I know. They there's a. Bunch of cousins. <laughs> so the other, the biggest herbs in Belize are probably jackass bitters and sorcy. Mm -hmm. And of course, sorcy is a wonderful thing to put on a fence between you and the neighbor dogs. Okay. They'll leave you alone. They'll leave. I put my sorcy and my uh, spinach together, so I just keep them on one fence. So <laughs> it works really good as a barrier. Your roses. Another good one to put on a fence, why? You've also added another layer of protection. You've got thorns, thorns, thorns. Anything you can add that puts a thorn in there as well, why not? Your sensitivity plants, the ones that shut down whenever you touch them. Super good for pain and I can't sleep. Boil up two branches of sensitivity plant and it'll put you to sleep right now. And so I try to keep those growing next to the fence, but instead of having somebody weed it all out, I hand weed my fences because I don't want the weed eater to kill off all the sensitivity plant. Yeah, I, I need have the, it. the gravel around close to the fence. So you just dig under the gravel to make a, a little trench. Exactly. Like a trench to stick it down there? Yeah. And see, then it would stay right on the fence. You just tie it right up to the fence, and now it's a fence plant. Yeah. Because there's so, so much gravel, I can't see when it to... Yeah, and they like that kind of soil. They like mostly gravel with very little dirt. They would really? take sand. They would take anything. They're aggressive. The sorcy. Yeah, Sorcy will take anything. <laughs> um, it likes life pretty, uh, pretty
pretty tough, <laughs> you know. Now this, everybody knows the trumpet leaf. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about how it's good to smoke it. Well, the most important thing to this is that it's an asthma medicine. Mm. So you just take the leaves, make tea, boil that tea up and, and drink that. That's an asthma medicine. Avocado, another asthma medicine. The leaves are as good for asthma as the seed. Now, asthma attack, you take one of those seeds, grate it up, boil it in two cups of water. It'll stop an asthma attack right now. And so these are the things that all we eat is the skin and the pulp on the outside, and we don't think anything else is good on it. How old does the seed have to be? Does it have to be like a live one or one no, that you can No, you can uh, birth control with, uh, with uh, avocado seeds, chop it up dry, chop it up, dry it, and then drink it for three months, and you'll be sterile for nine. And the leaf? Uh, the seed. seed. I mean, there's a lot of different things that avocado works for. <laughs> I've had people ask me about birth control lately. Seen, somebody told me yesterday they take the seed and blend it in a blend tech blender and use the seed. Yes, the seed is very, very powerful. And I've just gotten into it in the last <coughs> month. It's come up in a lot of asthma recipes. Mm -hmm. So well, just, and There's no fear of taking that and then that being sterile for nine months and then stopping it and then not being fertile again? There are certain plants in this country that if you take them for long enough, you are sterile for life. Okay. Male and female? Uh, male and female, but mostly female. Mm. And uh, there's ways to reverse it, but I don't know how good those reversals work. Did you say papaya? Yeah, papaya Everything seed. Everything in moderation, right? Papaya seed, if you take it for how many months is it, like five or? You take a certain time in the cycle. And then it's three days before your cycle is supposed mm -hmm. to start or something like that. And you do it for enough months and it's permanent sterility. But it saves operations. Mm -hmm. you, don't so, have, you have some cotton seed here, not a lot. No. Them, but cotton seed workers in India, and not skin, excuse me, China, have had sterility issues. Because, yeah, that's one of the problems with cotton seed oil. Yeah. Cotton seed oil. Yeah. We try not to use it. Mm -hmm. Cotton seed is not one for, you know, it's going to make you sterile. Mm -hmm. Now, lime leaf, coffee leaf, these two together are a mood enhancer. I'm having a bad day. I'll take that little bit of rose petal. Bam. Change your mind about the day. Wonderful little plants. And that's wild coffee, which Everybody says coffee is just a stimulant. No, the rest of the plant is not a stimulant. It'll put you to sleep. The leaves, the branches, it'll put you to sleep. It's like so, sedative, not permanent. Yeah, just, just that, you know, just, I gotta go to, I don't sleep well at night. I got a lot of people like that. They just don't sleep at night. And it's nice to be able to give them something simple like that, which I also add to that mulberry leaf. Because the mulberry leaf is the same way. It helps you to relax and go to sleep. And then if they can't do a, go to sleep on that, then we start kicking it up. Then it's passion vine, sensitivity plant, moringa. Three moringa seeds boiled in a cup of water. It's supposed to be a great knockout drug. But these are things that you have to, you know, studying herbs for me, since I was 16 when I started, so it's been a lot of years of trying to figure out which plant does what. And then trying to find a place to put it where I can find it again. <laughs> That's why we have these. That was the next place I was going to go. Everybody that wants to do this kind of stuff should definitely get themselves a library. There is not one book, one group of knowledge. This is one of my favorite places to go for ID. That's a landscaping book for this. But I've found more plants through the landscaping book and gotten 100% ID off of it than I can find through the best herbal in this country. And we all know that it's lacking in a lot of things. I can't read that from here. What, would you give the names? Of this is the Rainforest Remedy by um, Rosita. Okay. okay. Um, this one is called the Tropical Ornamentals Guide. Um, this one I got just for landscaping. But through it, you're going to end up finding a lot of your plants that, like, here's your euphobias. You're going to find a lot of your plants that um, 
maybe you didn't know for sure. You, you almost have to thumb through them to really get it down. This plant in both north and down here is probably the best field guide. And this is an eyewitness handbook. It's by a company called Dorley Kindersley. Dorley Kindersley writes books like this. Pictures and guides. And it's, you know, you can find what you're looking for. You might have to look it up in the index because some of them do it. Like this one's by tree, shrub, herbaceous plant vines. If you don't know what you're looking at, you might have to just go to the back and say, this is what they told me it is. The can hardest thing. Can you get that thing, on Amazon? Huh? Can you get that through Amazon? Probably Amazon for this one. Dorley Kindersley has a lot of books out that her eyewitness, uh, or that eyewitness news books are awesome. They've got butterflies, they've got mushrooms, they've got herbs, they've got just about anything with an eyewitness. This is the best book I ever bought my god. And that's another Dorley Kindersley. That's the American Horticulture Society's Book of Medicinal Plants. It's an encyclopedia. So again, you're going to deal with photographs, And a lot of times I find myself flipping through books because I saw that picture somewhere. I'm a visual learner. So I keep a lot of visual books around for that reason. This book's okay, but she again lacks some of the visual that we need. They like to write all the stuff down and not to give you the picture. Is that the other right book right. in our book? Yeah, this is the newest of the, the of Rosita books. This is the Messages of the Gods. So it's this book expanded mm -hmm. by the 3,000 plants that were given to her by all the local healers. It also has um, transcripts of the interviews she did with those healers. Mm -hmm. But so, her index is by Latin word only, right? Latin word only. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Which really helps us all out, doesn't it? And there's no index in the book. The ebook has a common name index, but the book doesn't. Kate has the ebook and she has the common word index in hers. But the book doesn't have it. This one I like because we got both common and Latin names in it. And it does go by Latin. Learning a little Latin is the best thing I ever did. It makes sense. These around. I guess we take a little bit of a look at what I've drawn. These are just two different house plans, two different ideas. Um, oh, see, this here's our gumbo limbo tree with our bark. Like without the five dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Seven yeah. dogs. Seven Six dogs. dogs, excuse me. I got rid of one finally. Six dogs. <laughs> one in the right direction. She got <laughs> lost. <laughs> I hope she found a better home than with six other dogs. <laughs> but other than what I've got here, most of this grows in my yard. I've just planted this, so I stopped by the side of the road to get this. This is Kalawala, which I've just been getting calls on. Everybody wants Kalawala. She's come out on the internet as being the best anti-cancer medicine you can get. But they see her uh, I've seen it both ways. The African spelling is K-A, Kala, Kalawala, and the, uh, the locals spell it with a C. Mm -hmm. But it's... Can you use the rhizome or the leaf? Mostly that little gadget at the end. Yeah. <laughs> and it's fuzzy. That fuzzy, fuzzy thing down there is apparently really, really good for this. And MS, multiple sclerosis seems to, it seems to be a nervine, so that's going to help with multiple sclerosis. Um, in a yard, that can be a little bit... Um, Aggressive in a, if it sticks out that I mean it's, it's, it's what seven feet long. Most of the time it grows up in the uh, trees. Yeah, uh, these all grow on the side of the road. Really? Yeah. This is all in one cut on the side of my road, hmm. and I just went up to the cut and pulled, and I was holding here, so that was all the way back into the hillside. <laughs> What's the name of that one? This is bear paw fern or calawala. Is there another fern as big so you don't mix them up? No. So you can look for that and... This is the only fern you're going to find that big. And then what you're going to find is it's a lot like the Boston fern. Hard, doesn't have any fuzzy little things on it. It's a hard fern. So the Boston fern is the same thing though. You can use Boston fern for kidneys, 
detox, um, all of all of that stuff. You know, all the ferns run about the same thing. They're just all really good for detoxing the whole body. And you boil the, that thing on the bottom. Yeah. And then you strain it really good because I've heard that the, it's, a, it's kind of a hairy little item. And I did get some of that hair on my arm the other day. Itches, irritant, counter irritant. <laughs> you know, and counter irritants have their purpose. You have arthritis, you're supposed to take something like that that itches and rub it over your arthritic joints. <laughs> I said, now how's that work? And they said, it's a counter irritant. It's gonna get blood to go all the way through those joints to the surface of the skin. And the blood will flush back out and with it, it takes all that metal that's stuck in your joints. And I went, okay. Are any of those plants that seem to be counter irritant? People use, you know, that uh, it's, 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 it's very cold, you know, numbing your fingers that have poor circulation. I haven't <laughs> found that. I would use probably, um... It's going on my I can't think of the name of Reynolds syndrome. Reynolds. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. No, I haven't, I haven't seen anything. I would probably try counter irritants because what you've got is a lack of circulation that you can't feel. And you know, you want, some people, they get so cold, they get numb. Yep. Yeah, it's almost like they... It's like painful. Yeah, really painful. Yes, I lived in cold country for too long, and I didn't do good with cold. <laughs> didn't do cold. And northern Idaho is not a good place for if you don't like cold. <laughs> yeah, so this is what I've got here. Are there any other questions about plants that you've been interested in? Yes, ma'am. Gail first. I just um, uh, wanted to know, you picked up the, um, um, I can't remember the name of it now, the gumbo limbo. Yes. What is that good for? Gumbo limbo is like an antibiotic in this country. It's good for skin diseases and it's also good for internal skin or internal infections. Hmm. So you can boil a piece of bark like this and in about two cups of water and wash any rash, any eczema, any psoriasis, anything like that, this would be really good for it, especially if you mixed it with about this much of this. And in about two cups of water and wash any are rash, any eczema, and any psoriasis, anything like that, this would be really good for it, especially yeah. if you mixed it with All about formulas this have a king herb, all formulas have a queen herb. They assist each other. Are a perfect catalyst and, and they also all have herb. a good formula, always say it has an assistant, which deals with the queen and boosting her. And they have a slave that takes out the trash. So if I was to be making a formula here, this would be the slave. And then I would probably put this in as an assistant to my queen herb. Oregano. Oregano is a disinfectant for the whole body. So well, that's what you're doing with this plant is disinfecting. And then this one is healing. The king is always the healer. So you would just make a tea out of all those branches? And, and I usually add one more thing. And if I was with this on the table, I would probably go to mint to give it a little more flavor and a little bit more permeability through the stomach. And that's just, I like five, I like five herb combinations. Mm -hmm. Well, really fine. If you make them one or two potent, can they make you sick or nauseous? Or Not like usually. There are times where we've killed off bugs in your system where you get sicker before you get better. It's called Herxheimer effect. <laughs> and you feel kind of like, what did I do to myself? I'm sick. And if you just ride the wave, by tomorrow or the next day, you'll be feeling really good. But a lot of times, if you're killing something off in your system fast, your body's going to tell you about it. It's going to rebel. It liked living with the parasite. They became copacetic. You start killing off that guy, now the body says, wait a minute, I was okay with this. And, you know, in this country, parasites are a big issue. Everybody should address parasites at least four times a year. Um, we drink the water around here. We swim in the rivers. I mean, there's parasites everywhere. And they're amoebas, they're protozoas, they're small little guys. Leishmaniasis is a protozoa that gets inside of the cell and lives in the, my, uh, the uh, mitochondria of the cell and stays there the whole time. So it's cellular. And it'll never heal unless you get rid of it. It'll go systemic. 
And where the way they get rid of it here is antimony shot into the sore once a day for 28 days. Is that the same days. thing with the beetworm? No. Mm. It's a much different little disease called chicolero sore. And it doesn't heal. And if you leave it long enough, it goes systemic. But if you get rid of it right away, it stays right in the surface of the skin. It likes a place where it can keep your skin just open enough to be able to breathe, similar to what the bee form does. And um, that's the leishmaniasis, right? Yes, <coughs> I've had it. It's it's def difficult to get rid of. So you get it through a wound? Yeah, it's actually it's the bite of a mosquito, no, a sand fly that got, that bit a female bush rat that had leishmaniasis that given to it by a mosquito. And only the females can pass it on, so if you get it, your luck is just in the toilet, man. <laughs> That's what my skin doctor told me. He says, you don't have really good luck, do you? I said, no. <laughs> and he says, yeah, because it takes a female mosquito, a female bush fly, and a female rat. And they all have to be in the same vicinity for you to get leishmaniasis. I've known several people that have gotten it though. Are you in the mountain pioneer chair? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the guy that I went to is Dr. Craig. Mm -hmm. And he was 16, 17 years as the mountain pine ridge doctor for all of the the um, troops, BDF. And he just he drew me the best picture about it. He says it's just like having a rat under the stove in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Everybody's decided not to chase the rat right now. <laughs> and you got to get rid of it. you got to make it go away. And, he said, and so it's a shot. We used a diabetes needle, bent it at a 45, and put antimony, which is one below arsenic on the periodic table, pure, pure poison, into the hole six times around each injection. Each time was six times around the hole until it bled out until all that juice started fall, coming out of the sore each time. Yeah. But in the States, it's a heart stint and 28 days on antimony. So... And so which herb do you use for that? You use any of the ones that bleed white. And what they've told me is you just take that and you completely circle the whole thing, good skin and bad skin with that white, put a band-aid over it, and be ready to hurt, because it hurts. It and feels like somebody's in there just burning you with a hot rod. What's a bleed, bleeds white? What does that mean, white? Uh, white mm -hmm. comes out whenever you pick a leaf, okay. or so a white. stem, or, or, or uh, there's that little... There's a little, blow, a little blib of white, almost latex. If you, Some of them, if you play with it long enough, it'll latex. turn into a latex. Gardenia exactly, like you know, before. that latex is toxic. All the euphorbias. Is that... The same thing that's in um, mango? Mm hmm So you could use that. Yes, the thing mango works. The dog mm -hmm. balls that you see, the little red dog ball trees, those are a rubber tree. That works. A um, whole lot of trees that do that. They bleed this white liquid that comes out. They're very good for surface problems if you need to get something out. <coughs> so you just take a mango leaf. And, and that little bit of white that comes out, you just take the liquid and you just paint the spot. And then put a band-aid on it and just leave it. Leave it. And that's good for bee form, too. It'll kill the bee form. Mm. And, you know, plastic kills the bee form. Uh, you supposedly can do it with a little bit of tobacco. You can supposedly do it with a little bit of Vaseline. You've just got to suffocate the hole. And you put a piece of saran wrap over it. And if you can suffocate the hole, the bee form dies. It comes out. It tries yeah. to get out so it can breathe. Yeah. It comes out because of it. It'll come out on its own because of it. Now dogs, you know, I have to do it all the time with my dogs because they're out on the porch. You've got a bee form in their leg. You've got to get the bee form out. How long does it take? To get a boat to kill it? Yeah. No time at all. As long as it takes to be without oxygen, I think. <laughs> yeah, they start coming out right away. As, yeah, as they don't want to be. As soon as you cover up the breathing hole, they're on their way out. Because that's it. It's, it's like their little hole, their little air conditioner hole that they keep open for you. You know. But most of these, you know, you can boil up this and get a wormer if you boil it strong enough. You know, light, it's just a little bit of something for a lady and her cramps. Boil a little longer, it's good for cleansing your blood. Boiled a lot longer and drank, it's good for alcoholics. They'll never be able, they won't be able to drink a 
bit of liquor. For how long? Permanently? No, for that day. Oh. But they drank that. Too bad it's not permanent. Oh, there's hope for you. <laughs> Only for a day. Yeah, you know, um, like I said, women used to use it as they put it in the man's bitters if they had to. So what part is that again? They put it in men's the bitters. Ferns, the type of fern? It's a, the Have ferns. It? This one's the maidenhair fern. Maidenhair. But it is good for alcoholics to keep them from drinking. Where is Artemisia from? Artemisia is mostly, Artemisia. In, uh, uh, it likes island type of soils like Greece. So it likes mountains. A little bit looser Fair. soil. Yeah. We do have an Artemisia that grows here. Um, wormwood, actually. Yeah. But we don't get any of the nice ones like the silver, frilly, soft ones. And the sages out of the deserts in the southwest are all artemisias. The one that they use for high mountain desert sage incense is an artemisia. It's not a sage. So that little white kind of house plant thing that we have here is no good? No, that one's a good one for incense and it's also called wormwood. And you can use that to worm yourself with. It's another one, well, it's what they make abseth from. Mm. And, you know, abseth is a powerful spirit. It comes from the power of the plant that they put in it. Mm -hmm. And artemisias are on that border of, if you do enough of it, it's a shaman drug. So, kind of are, are there any good ones to, to get kind of... Established around your houses? I'd like to, I like to put these around my porches. They're really beautiful. They make your stoop look really great. You know, I like to take my hibiscus and do them down the sides of the, the borders and then just keep them a little tighter. You can do, I do this as a hibiscus because it's the most powerful as far as medicine goes. But it's called a Turk's cap hibiscus. The hummingbirds like this one better than all of them. And it has the most hemostatic value. And hemostatic being it slows your blood to flow down. So if you cut yourself and you drink any kind of tea out of that, you have an ulcer, it stops the bleeding. Um, this is a food more, life everlasting. Also for an asthma attack, you steam this leaf, <coughs> mash it, make juice, take a tablespoon of the juice, it's supposed to be really good for an asthma attack. This is scorpion tail. We found it this morning, so we brought it. But you can see that the plant has almost like a very funny little end to it. Is it called heliotrope also? Uh-huh, it's one of the heliotropes. And the one we all like is purple and big and gorgeous, but this is the, the wild form of heliotrope, which is a scorpion tail. Um, this one doesn't have as many, but the leaf is kind of sticky, like a, um, almost like a um, nettle. It has that nettle feel to it. Uh, the, my teas tend to be out of, I do a lot of tea out of the balsam. The cedar is a really good cold tea. Allspice, I mean, this is the best leaf in the world. First thing I ever heard about this was from my guide. He says, you take one leaf, put it in your beer for energy at the end of the day. And he says, that was what most of the guys used to do here 50 years ago. One piece of allspice down in your one beer that you could afford today. And it would be like, wow, take all that work out of you, all the heat gone. So, you know, these are the things that you start listening to the old timers and you get all these really great stories. But I wanted to leave this so everybody could get a chance to look at everything that they wanted to. I've tried to get it all labeled for you. If there's any questions, I'm sure that one of us can answer that question. Yes, ma'am. What are you doing for conjunctivitis? Guava leaf and roses. Estevin was the oldest known eye drops in the world. They came out of Mexico. It was pure and simply rose water. Wow. How about provision bark? Do you ever use that? I love provision bark. I just don't have a, a big enough tree to harvest my own yet. I have a thousand trees if you want. Oh gosh, provision bark is, everybody should be doing a little bit of provision bark in their life. It's just a food, a tonic, just like this. But how like would you use it? Like if you wanted to use some every day, how would you use it? I would just put it in my everyday tea, or I boil up some and keep it in the fridge already boiled, and, and then, then just add it to my everyday tea. Green bark or dark bark? Yeah, I do the dark bark. I get a really red, they curl, and they're red when they're done. The people that bring them to me, it's, it's like, so it must be inner bark. 
Yes. Are you using the fruit on the Ramon or the petition tree? I would like to use Ramon fruit for flower, but I haven't found enough for myself to be able to do that. I know people that have it. We should really be trying Ramon flower in this country. I mean, it's supposed to have about a five-year storage because exactly. it's so low in fats. That it's, and it's uh, supposed to be one of these flowers that you could replace wheat with. Yeah, that's why I was asking. And it actually will make a bread, a nice bread, I've been told. I don't know about I it. use it all the time. Do you? And see, I'd love to get some Ramon flour. I uh, at one point was told I had some trees on the property, but the property's been bushed since then. And I can't watch what everybody cuts half the time. <laughs> I don't know the mature tree. I've seen it in Bloom and I recognize it. There's a lot of it down around St. Matthews. Okay. Yeah. In that general area and back towards the You know, these area. are the foods of the Maya. I have a book at home. I didn't bring one of the <clears> books <throat> I use. It's called the Ancient Mayan uh, Ancient Maya Plants and Animals. And it's got a lot of information about the foods eaten from all these trees in the bush and stuff like that. Um, when I really start to study a plant out, every one of these books has to be open. And I start writing and jotting and writing and jotting and writing and jotting. And, you know, I love it when we have five or six people over to the class and we're looking up one plant and everybody's got a book because then we all get a chance to educate each other. Um, there's no way I can remember all that stuff. So it's called the Mayan? It's called uh, Ancient Maya Plants and Animals. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's more of an archaeology book, and I yeah. use it as a color book. Mm -hmm. I like to color, and it's got black and white drawings. <laughs> and so I go out into the bush, and I find all the plants that I want, and I color them to, to spec. To give myself something to do. <laughs> well, that's, that's my question. Uh, See? I'm generally healthy. What is the memory plant? <laughs> the memory <laughs> plants are rosemaries and sages. <laughs> you want to get more rosemary and sage because rosemary is a capillary stimulant. When our memory starts to go, it's because the capillaries are starting to shut down between our veins and our arterial flow. And more of us should be drinking rosemaries and sages unless they're trying to have children. Women who are trying to help children should not touch either. They are not for women. How do you keep, do you keep the sage alive in this rain? <clears throat> Almost impossible. The rosemary too. It does not like the moisture in the air here. Does it grow here? Rosemary? I'm trying again. It's not growing. It's not doing good. It's dying on me. I got a little plant the other day and it's already just getting ready to expire. Is your sage still alive? Yes. The sage is, is doing good. <laughs> yeah, mine too. I'm poor. It's mine, but we I have to cut it back. Well, anytime you want to get rid of any of that, so Steve, you just give it to me. You just take it and you throw it. If I want to get rid of it, I have to make sure it's dead before I throw it in my compost pile. <laughs> well, I'm always looking for sage. Right, right, some next time. I'm always looking for sage. I make incense with it, and I also use it in tea all the time. Yes, ma'am. I don't have my own copal tree. I just buy it through my my Guatemalan dealers. But the trick to copal is it has to be done today on the full moon. And you build a small little brush fire. It doesn't have to be very big. You cut the tree in a V like you would for um, um, Chicolero. Um, you put in a bucket and a, and a spit. And then you put this little fire right underneath that area at the roots. And before you know it, in the full moon, it'll just start running sap out of that thing. Mm. And now this is all what I've, been, what I've read on harvesting copal. Um, I've never done it. I don't have a tree big enough to go harvest. Do you, have, do you use the resin? Yeah. And the resin I that? use mostly not for anything on skin. <laughs> People have said, put it on your skin. I went, yeah, right. And they did it, and they got burnt. It will burn your skin straight. But you can put it in oil about um, a quarter to one, you know, like one cup to a quarter cup of copal. I use it when I'm making copal oil. I put it in the bottom of my oil and leave it in the sun for a long time till it finally disintegrates into it. I, have, I make copal oil with coconut oil, which is really good for the skin. Once you dilute it, it's very good for psoriasis and eczema and bad sores <coughs> and stuff like that. And you have to remember in this country, cancer was what you called a sore. 
So when you're talking to old timers and they say this plant's good for cancer, this plant's good for cancer, make sure you clarify whether they're talking tumors and cancerous growths or whether they're talking a sore. Because they were so used to sores that would never heal that they just called them all cancer. You know, a sore that doesn't heal is it's just not good. So that's what they do, you know. So now on copal, I burn it because I like the smell of it. Oh yes. Do the vapors do anything to your respiratory system, good or bad? Not no. really. Not really. If you want to affect your respiratory for good, you need to do an there's a way to breathe in essential oils. Essential oils have enough medicine in just the aroma of them that they can heal your lungs, they can heal your alveoli, they can heal a lot of stuff inside. Um, you don't want to breathe water. Too much smoke, we all know, is not good for you. <laughs> no, our, our house is open now. I just like the smell. I, I mix it with, with sage and rosemary until I can get it to burn freely. And then I can I put it on a stick and I can burn the whole thing and I just love it. <laughs> We can buy yes, these sir. little balls in the in the little um, rolls. Market. Of, yeah. Um, how do they make that? Is that rosemary and? No, mostly the little balls are just copal. Well, they're real brown and crumbly. There's got to be something. They else dehydrate there. them for a really long time, or they I'm not sure where they get that. I've got a lot of really crumbly bark or sap, but it's from a gumbo limbo, and it's like resin, you know, just hard and crumbly. And I have had copal like that. And the longer I keep it, especially if I take it north, it'll dry out really quick up north. Down here, I don't have as much problem with it. It stays, it gets a hard finish on the outside, but it's still gooey in the inside. By the time I got it to Texas, it was powder. Yeah, straight powder. exactly. It dries out really quick. I was looking for something that's similar named the uh, Copa Ifera. Oh, I've, heard, I've heard of that one. Yeah. Is yeah. Known as, it used to be known as a kerosene. Tree and now it's a diesel tree. Yeah. And the last quote I saw was like 150 bucks a liter for the. Uh, so I'd like to find burn, somebody that you're not going to burn it for diesel at that price, yeah. but what that was for, medi um, for medicinal purposes. Oh and yeah. I, and I just wanted to know what it was. Number one is it can it be found here? Because I, I don't find know. It. Oils I can't are not. Find it. And if I was going to do one, it'd be the seed nut, the seed oil from this plant from moringa. Now I. I wrote a guy in Brazil that used to sell the uh, ben, oil Lang bin. Tank. No, he used to sell the Langdorfi for 550 bucks a pound for the seed. But he wrote back and said you're better off with the moringa and just crushing the stem once you goat seed all the leaves off of it. So ah. uh, but the question comes back to what oil are we talking about in the moringa stem? Yeah, because it's the seeds that I've always heard. Yeah, I've always heard the seeds the too. The seeds make oil of Ben, and oil of Ben is a cosmetic oil that's been coveted for thousands of years. Yeah, but that's what he was saying. I'd be better off crushing the, the stem on huh. that. I never thought about not, that. Not that fine, but you know, I'm talking about big stems. Yeah, you know, five, they're six sweet foot stems, that way. Yeah. So, it might so, have what all, so what oil are we looking for there? What was that? It's probably going to have slightly different properties from the stem. And Every the part of the moringa plant can be used, but it all has a little bit different nutrition or medicinal property. Yeah. Exactly. You can take every one of these stems and steam them like an asparagus. Well, they take the, the horseradish cool. from it also yeah. and eat it too. And just eat it like that. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be really good for you. As long as the stems, you know, they've got a little juice in them, they're supposed to be, you can use them like a little bit of asparagus or something. Uh -huh. You know. Cool. I haven't how, been that hungry. How about <laughs> castor bean? Do you use that at all? I like haven't used much castor, but I had a mother that told me so many horror stories about castor oil. I guess maybe that's you why I don't you use it. for some then. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a lot of castor plants. They come up everywhere. They're a bush plant, so it's hard to keep them gone. Um, the seeds and the leaves are everywhere, you know. Right, right, ricin. ricine. Ricine. And that's a, that is a rat killer. So you make ricine from grinding up the seeds and you can put it out with some sugar for the rats and they'll come eat it and maybe a little tallow. And you can poison rats right and left. The good ones and the bad ones. Which was it that, um, that you said that it was on that table that you said you uh, used for bites. 
Uh, Ish Ishkanon. Yeah, Ishkanon. Ishkanon. Yeah, Ishkanon. And if, if you can't find that one, Jackass Bitters is just as good. You take a leaf of Jackass Bitters, roll it up until it's got some juice, put that on the bite, it'll get rid of the sting right now. You know, um, Ishkanon is just a skin savior, is what they say. Good for fungus and good for bacteria and good for all sorts of infections and and for bug bites, they say just a leaf of this stuff and rolled until you get enough juice off of it and just put it right on the bite. Does that have a common name that the people around here would? Poly know? redhead. Poly redhead. And does it grow in shade or sun? A little bit both. Right. It'll grow just about anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I need some. Wildlife like it's like it's ten million fans all in my yard, and I yeah, can't, can't get rid of it. Once yeah, once it gets it in, in there, it's pretty much going to stay there. there. Oh. You know, in fact, I, I get I get them where they get too tall, and they're brittle. And Rob just thinks it's funny because I go out there and I just start snapping stems off of it <laughs> and throwing them in his burn pile, and he has to go all over the burn pile. <laughs> well, they're, they're nice. You can shape them. Really oh yeah, they make a really nice the landscape plant. Yeah. I love the way they shape. They shape like a hibiscus. You can either make a hedge out of them or you can make a Tree. rangy, unruly plant out of them. Depends on what you want to do with it. What's, what's your application? See, and I do hibiscus in every size and form and then try to figure out where they fit best in the yard. <coughs> what about sorrel leaf? Is that sorrel leaf is not as good as the sorrel flower. But the sorrel leaf is just like this one. It's going to be hemostatic, meaning that it slows down the flow of blood. Snake bite, different things like that where you want to slow your blood flow down. These are good plants to have on hand. I used them a lot because I was doing midwifery for a long time. We used it after birth. It would stop a bleed right now. Start getting her to drink some of this tea. And if she's got a, a too much blood flow, things would start slowing down right now. So, Are most of these plants cuttings? Can yes. you take from cuttings and they'll root? Well, most of this I don't think does cuttings, except for Moringa. Um, none of those. This one will. Sage just one. Yeah, sage will do cuttings. Um, this one will grow from cuttings. Sorcy. That'll grow from cuttings because the only thing I use is the root. Which one? Um, this oregano. oregano. Um, snake plant doesn't do cuttings. And you have to take starts from your lemongrass. The uh, sassafras does well on cuttings. Yes. Yeah, just chopping about two. Oh, you just two inch sections. You can't get rid of that stuff. This mother-in-law's time. Yeah, you could cut each branch. You yeah. could cut each thing into little pieces, and it would just root off of itself. Same with this one. You lay this on the ground, and it'll start plants all the way around it. So you've got a lot of nopal after you put that on there. <laughs> What's the Santa Berry good for? Um, it's good for diabetes. You chew one of the, the, the pieces of, of this, and it'll get rid of a sugar in your blood right now. Wow. It's really, 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 really good, especially if you just got diagnosed with diabetes. They say start chewing that daily. It'll be gone. Yes, ma'am. Are you familiar with the Rain Tree yes. website? Because that's really, I find that really good. Um, I've used his, his website quite a bit. Well, they... It tells what all the different chemical compounds are, all the alkaloids or the saponins or the terpenes or the... And that's always, a, the more you get into this as a backyard study, the more you want to eventually move yourself into what, why does it work? You know, because they've got enough studies now that they can tell you what the terpene or the sesquin was, the sesquine was that, that worked in it, what caused that to work. Uh, this one... Balsam has a dexamethorphan in it. That's why it stops coughs. You know, um, they've all got something in them that makes them work. They're now doing all the chemical studies. And, heck, if you want to know all that, just get a Rosita's book. It well, tells you all that, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And this one, for what it does, it does get into all of that. All the studies that have been done on the plant. And with these people, it's... You know, the study is what rules. Old medicine, they'll say somebody said that it's done this way, but we don't know how they did it, so we don't know how to tell you to do it. 
and in our studies it didn't work that way in vitro on rats. Well, what's kind of nice about the, the website is if you find out, um, you know, something that is from South America, say, and it has those things in it, then maybe you can find a plant here that has exactly. those same things in it, even though nobody has ever told you that that's a And that's, a plant you know, that's when you take your study the next step level. Mm -hmm. I have two classes I do on Saturday. I try to do just herbs. And that comes to questions and answers about different systems. This one works for respiratory. This one works for kidneys. You know, we just do simple herbs, similar to this. Uh, what I want to start on su Sundays is going to be a medicine maker's day. Oh, cool. And so it's going to be more about formulas and medicine and whys and hows. And, and out of it, I'll end up getting people to make medicine. You know, for me, they'll start out making it for me. They'll go home and make it for themselves afterwards, you know. Well, and do you use any of that as preventive types of things? Because I would, I would rather just eat a few leaves once in a while off mm -hmm. something instead of having to get sick and then go make a tea. I make a lot into tinctures because that's the only way to keep it in this country without mold. Other, unless you've got a big 18-gallon freezer. I have a 16 that sits But full if you of have leaves. them growing around, you could just Then you don't eat have to worry. Leaves, right? Exactly. Eat a few leaves um, I have again. so much demand that now it's I can't keep up with the tea flow out. And people who don't do their own and it's like, wow, okay, we're drawing another couple of pounds of whatever tea that I made last week and I'm going, "Oh gosh. Okay, we need a faster drying system." <laughs> um, yeah, that would be hard. Yeah, it's key. when it's in your yard and you're doing it yourself. Herbal medicine is preventative more than it is curative. It's hard to take enough herbs to cure a tumor in your lungs. You got it long term. And it takes a lot of herbal medicine. It also takes a commitment that says, okay, to get rid of cancer, I need to get rid of this, this, this in nutrition. I need to add this, this, this in herbs. I need to do it every day. I need to not fail. It's easier to go to the oncologist having poisoned the tumor and, you know, it just depends on how the person's capable of running their own life, you know. Um, some of us, it wouldn't be so hard, we'd just do it. But again, you're starving a disease, so expect to get sick. It wants to stay alive just like you do. So Herxheimer effect in natural medicine is real. You get sicker sometimes before you get better. You're when you make your tinctures, what it, do you use vodka? What do you use? Sometimes here? I use vodka. If I run, want a really heavy extraction, I use the 150 proof like dum dum rum that they make here. It's called overproof. Dum dum rum. They call it dum dum. Um, it's overproof, but it's 150 pr proof. Uh, like rum, white rum. It's and really cheap stuff. That you oh, get. super cheap. And the guys like your own bottle and they dip it out of a barrel. Vodka <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> is too expensive. I can't do it here. Well, so. and, and you have to realize that you're never going to leave a tincture at more than 25 percent alcohol. So, if you start with 80 proof vodka, that's 40 percent alcohol. I can break my tincture after I make it with the alcohol with almost as much water as I started with. Really? So I get twice as much tincture. Wow. It won't mold until it gets under 10% alcohol. And how do you know how much of your tincture to give somebody for certain things? Is it like trial and error or do you like... Yeah. Move? I yeah. start them low and then I move them up. Huh. I'll titrate them up. Um, I'm a little better now. I, I do a little bit of muscle testing for them. It's sort of ethereal, so if you don't believe in it, you won't even understand it. <laughs> but I will test on somebody. I have this pendulum. I'll make formulas with pendulums. I have a chart. Tell me how much of something to put in. You know, I'll have the five herbs out and say, who's the king? And we'll sit there with the plants for a while sometimes. Sometimes I make people, I go into their yard and take a look at what's growing. I used to do this all the time. I'm going, go take a look at your yard. Ah, oh, you've got a yard full of dandelions. You have a liver condition. And sure enough, 
Oh yeah, I do. Well, why aren't you out there digging the dandelions and putting it in your tea? Eat the roots, put the greens in your salad, make the tea up. It's good for liver dysfunction. You know, I, a lot of times you can tell what's wrong with somebody by taking a walk in the yard. Plants are connected through the soil to the same thing as you are. All trees are interconnected, all plants are interconnected, you know. That's why when you take them, you do a sustainable harvest or else you've injured the community. So it's, it's conscious. Um, different people get different formulas. And that comes from me meeting with them and deciding that they would probably do better with this herb than the other. And asking them some questions about allergies. You know, if you're allergic to coneflower, I am not going to give you echinacea. I'm going to give you olive leaf. Same properties, two different herbs. <laughs> you know, and one's a flower and one's a leaf. Leaves don't tend, tend to have as much allergic reaction, almost there's people in the world that are allergic to flowers all over the place. Pollen, all that stuff comes from the flowers. What about the papaya leaf? Is that used often? Papaya leaf is used mostly as a tenderizer. They wrap up a lot of stuff in it to tenderize with it. I've had people use it for facial tenderizer, mm -hmm. for those peels, where they'll take a papaya leaf, steam it, and then use it on their skin. Yes, ma'am. Perfect for wart removal, too. Yeah. I've actually used that. Um, I use it for anything that starts to go wrong with me. Uh -huh. I do a papaya leaf and lime juice. Good. And garlic and hot sauce. Yeah. And it knocks out every single thing. And if you look it up online, papaya leaf is an absolutely cure all for dengue fever within 24 hours. It is. It's it, it kills bugs and tough bugs, like dengue. The leaf. Yeah, but see, I use jackass in the same form for. Okay. You go on a protocol with me and it's jackass bitters for two weeks. Yeah, and the jackass bitters does the same thing though, but it's anti-amoeba, anti-parasitic, anti-worm, anti-everything like that. So it's killing all off all those things. The only thing you can't really kill really easily is a virus. Viruses have to run their course. You know? Any other questions? Want to look at the tables in the books? The books are here for you guys to look at.